Good evening. God has spoken to us very clearly and loudly already tonight through the worship and the message that was given by Rob. You don't really need me tonight. Quite often when I come here, I almost feel guilty delaying you from getting to ministry time. You want to go right from worship right onto the lines. But I have been scheduled to talk about rejection. Now those of you who have been in other sessions will know that all of you attending have to make a decision that there are only two groups of people here tonight. And you have to decide which group you're in because it will totally determine the results of your visit here. And that all Christians fall into two categories. You're either in recovery or in denial. So which group are you in tonight? Those of you who are in denial, I know you're here to learn to help someone else. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 6. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. And the key words are the living stone, which was Christ, who was rejected by men, but what by God? Chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into the spiritual house. And you also, like living stones, rejected by men, but chosen by God. Now let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are the living stone, and that you understand rejection, and that you, though rejected here, were chosen by God, and that the one who trusts in you will never be put to shame. Father, I thank you that you have given us the way out of rejection. Now come, Holy Spirit, upon your people tonight. Father, we all want to be changed. Release your healing angels now to us, Father. Come and touch our souls. Touch our spirits, Father. Release your warring angels to break off the chains that we've carried for so long. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Father, open our minds and our hearts so that we only hear you tonight and that we don't hear the words of man, but that we hear directly from you. Father, just come and expose our chains, expose all the areas where we still need to be healed, and just come and pour your healing into us. So we give you this time. Father, I ask that you would shut the mouths of all deceiving spirits and lying spirits all distracting spirits, Father, in the name of Jesus, shut them up. We don't want to be distracted by lies tonight, Father. We only want to hear your voice. So, Father, clear our minds of the lies from our past, that we would only hear you. And come upon your people with fire tonight, that we would be transformed. In your name, amen. Now, I want to give you four scenarios of very common situations that you would all recognize. And I want you to think, what do all of these situations have in common? So I've made up fictitious names. The first one is Barb. She's a homemaker, a church worker, but was overly sensitive. She didn't know why. Her feelings were always being hurt by seemingly innocent remarks by people who loved her, and would, she would then take days and endless reassurance from her husband to get over it. Bob was a very successful businessman, 
He had lots of accomplishments to be proud of, but he was always very tense and defensive if anyone didn't totally agree with him. He was very active in the church and sought out leadership positions. Often, he was very demanding and impatient on church committees. He felt he had a more complete understanding of scripture than most people, and certainly more than other denominations. If everything didn't go his way precisely, he was very tense or angry. People were very intimidated around him, so they always tried to please him so he wouldn't erupt. Evelyn was a classic wallflower. She was always hiding at her church. She had to have a personal and specific invitation to every activity or she wouldn't come. She never just came on her own initiative. She never volunteered for anything. She always said she was too dumb to do anything right, so someone else should be asked. She would never lead out in prayer or in a small group. She wouldn't participate. She always felt her opinion was wrong or not worth wasting the group's time to listen to. She could never accept compliments, but always had to deflect them away or explain them away. And the last was Bill. He was a wild and crazy guy. He was always trying to entertain others and keep them laughing. He had a quick remark for every situation. He worked 14 hours a day and would rarely take a vacation. He was always trying to beat his sales goals and advance his career. He was very active in the church and volunteered for everything he could, but people felt exhausted just being around him. <laughs> now, do these four people sound familiar? Yeah, you know them. Insert your name. <laughs> these people are all so different, but they are all showing symptoms of rejection. But they all look so different. This is an incredibly common problem that God wants to set us free from. Now let's go back to what childhood was supposed to be. Childhood is so foundational in our attitudes and our emotional health. God intended that every child was to be a wanted child. That was the original plan. And that every child would receive unconditional affection from their parents in all circumstances. They would always be uh, shown affection and acceptance Failure would never be a threat, it would just be a learning experience. Love was never conditional, and you never had to be afraid. Children would then grow to accept themselves, they would have healthy self-confidence, and as teens, teens and adults, they would be, at, be able to handle adverse circumstances, handle rejection by others, and never lose their confidence, never take it personally. This was what was supposed to have happened. And they would always respond to criticism constructively and always see the good in it, always be optimistic, never threatened. But to have this level of healthy emotions, what do you need? Emotionally healthy parents. Well, that really narrows it down, doesn't it? <laughs> see, you have to have parents who have been so emotionally healed themselves that they can reflect God's nature to the children. But unfortunately, the mirror of reflection is cracked. And it's cracked by sin. It's cracked by the fall, our fallen nature. So parents were no longer able to reflect the perfect nature of God to their children because of the fall. So we're all wounded. And none of us have this kind of perfect upbringing or perfect result. So how does this rejection problem start? Well, the key is to realize that all of us have a personal spirit which enters our body at conception. And from that moment on, it's vulnerable to wounding. And from that time on, your, spiritual, your, your personal spirit is sensitive. And rejection and fear and all kinds of other negative emotions, but we're going to talk about rejection tonight. Rejection can be sensed at any point from conception forward. And it can leave permanent wounds even at that very, very early time. And one of the most severe forms of rejection are in people who, after conception, there was an attempt made to abort them. That is one of the most fundamental and earliest times and events of rejection. And so the people who have had that experience, who their own pregnancy, was, they, there was an attempt to terminate it, and obviously failed, they have a constant struggle with a feeling 
that they should die. Because that was placed upon them. And even people who were conceived and they became an unwanted pregnancy, an inconvenient pregnancy, a pregnancy that was rejected, the developing fetus spirit senses that and is wounded by that. And that stays until the wound is healed. And it doesn't matter how old you become, that wound stays until you're healed. And these children, when they are born, they know in their spirit that they are a nuisance, they are unwanted, and they're rejected. And many people who suffer this wound reject themselves from birth. And they don't believe they should be there at all because that was the first message they got as a fetal spirit. And this leads to a lot of emotional and behavioral problems. Now, I've been looking for an example of this. And today I was handed such an example. This is from one of you, handed to me today. And this is a person who is asking some important questions and they describe what they've experienced. They said that at the time of their conception, their pregnancy was very inconvenient, inconvenient unwanted, and was rejected. In fact, an illegal abortion was scheduled. And by some circumstances that happened in the family, they were unable to keep the appointment for the abortion. And then when they wanted to reschedule, the abortionist refused because they were busy doing other things. So the abortion never took place, but it had been scheduled. So as a result, this unwanted pregnancy, as soon as the baby was born, this person was given up for adoption because they rejected the child. However, the new family that they were adopted into, this is one of you remember, I just got this today. The new family, they couldn't bond with that family. And yesterday, when we prayed that God would show the lie that has so disrupted our lives, this particular person wrote down, that they felt that the lie was, you don't deserve to live, which is exactly what I had in my notes. I need an example. And that was the predominant feeling that they have had ever since. You don't deserve to live. They always put themselves on the side in the background. And they felt and they feel helpless. However, when we prayed, they saw that God had reached down to that fetus that was scheduled to die and protected me in that helpless state. And so now they're here tonight. Don't we have a great God? And I want to thank whoever submitted that, because that is precisely the illustration I need for this. And for whoever you are, you are suffering from the wounds of rejection. And you have just begun your healing process. You haven't completed it. You have begun it because now God has shown you the wound. And now God wants to lead you to freedom. So the answer to your question is, yes, you have just begun your process of freedom. And thank you for being so honest with us. Now in my office, I deal with lots of disturbed children. And I had a great deal of difficulty, being a scientist, understanding that anything could happen before birth that would have any problem with a person later on unless it was a physical injury that, that interfered with the pregnancy. And this is because I'm sort of a cognitive type, and I just sort of figure that if you don't remember it, it didn't happen or it wasn't important. And so that was always my mindset. So any of this prenatal stuff was kind of hocus-pocus, weirdo navel-gazing, introspective, and I don't understand it, so I'm not going to pay any attention to it stuff. Well, I had this little four-year-old who came to me because of behavior problems. This child was extremely violent. And this is a, a very violent four-year-old. The parents were afraid of this child. It was so violent and so dangerous. So they brought this child in, and he was just the cutest little button you'd ever want to see, and he was so nice to me, and, and we just clicked, and this was just the greatest little guy. He had a really good home. He had two parents who loved him, cared about him, who were home, and he had a very stable situation. There wasn't financial problems. Superficially, this family looked excellent. I couldn't understand why, at age four, he'd been so violent. And I said, well, how long has he been violent? Well, you know, as, as soon as he could pick up something. 
He was, he was violent right from, they brought him home from hospital, or so it seemed. And I thought this is very peculiar because it didn't sort of fit my normal patterns of uh, childhood uh, mood disorders, this kind of stuff. So I thought, how could this child be so violent so early? So I asked the parents, or asked the mother about the pregnancy. How was the pregnancy? Just fine. She's a very healthy person. There was never a problem during pregnancy. Well, I said, did you ever have any tremendous stress during the pregnancy? No, everything went fine. Well, I said, were there any conflicts during your pregnancy? Well, some, just minor conflicts, common conflicts. I said, well, give me an example of the worst common conflict. Well, she said I'd occasionally, well, fairly often get into fist fights with my mother-in-law. <laughs> well, you don't have to be a psychiatrist to figure this one out. <laughs> you see, this little fetus had been exposed to, exposed to violence its whole pregnancy. So is there any wonder this child came out swinging? Well, I'll tell you, I changed my whole attitude towards this whole matter of fetal wounding. I have an example. And there's all kinds of ways that fetuses can be hurt and infants can be hurt. All kinds of injuries can take place prior to your ability to remember. So, for example, if a, even after a baby's born, if a mother, through medical reasons or other reasons beyond her control, if she's unable to bond with a new baby, the baby spirit can interpret that as rejection, even though it may have been totally unintentional. Infants do sense things spiritual, spiritually. They can sense rejection, disappointment, even when there's no memory. If the parent is sick or too busy or, or, or spending time elsewhere, the child could interpret that as rejection. And you know, some people get very disappointed with the sex of a new baby. I mean, you always have a 50% chance, right, of you know, getting it correct, but sometimes you're, you get disappointed. And this, too, can be sensed by a baby if there's a disappointment about the resulting sex. And there are some of you, and I won't ask for a show of hands, there are some of you, and the only reason you're here is because your parents were trying for another child of a different sex than you. So then they had to try again because of you. And some of you have been wounded by that, that you weren't the right sex, and they had to try again. And that, in some people, that leaves a scar. And sometimes when it's severe, a baby can even reject its own sex because it, it senses that they're not the right one. And this can lead to tremendous confusion later in life because they, they might even choose to take on the characteristics of the desired sex and reject their own, and this causes all kinds of confusion, especially after adolescence. So these can be very serious wounds. Children can be rejected by parents and other people around them if they're physically awkward, if they're not accepted by other children, this can all be sensed as rejection. Kids can become very self-critical and feel worthless because of the way they're attacked by their peers, and they sense that as rejection, that wounds their spirit. Of course, obviously, teenagers, if they don't feel that they look right, if they're acceptable, if they talk right, if they don't fit in, they will feel rejected as well. And children can feel rejected if their parents are just too busy to show normal affection and touch hugs. They can interpret that as rejection. And that's emotional neglect when we don't touch children, show them warmth. And the children can uh, interpret that as rejection. You know, even if a sibling dies, the surviving child, even though it has nothing to do with him at all, can interpret that as rejection by the departing sibling. Or if a parent dies, that they will interpret that as rejection. And of course, certainly, if a, if a parent split, the child will very commonly sense that as a rejection of them. They will feel personally responsible, even though they aren't. But they will feel that way. So there's so many ways that children can feel rejected and wounding. You see, childhood is the time of greatest vulnerability to wounding of all sorts. And certainly, rejection is very common. So children need repetitive reassurance to build their confidence, to build their self-image. And the more cold and rigid a family is, the more fearful and rejecting the children become. And childhood rejection leaves very deep and lasting wounds. And it doesn't matter how old you become, you can carry childhood wounds of any kind, and particularly rejection, because that's what we're discussing. 
And when you carry wounds, you are vulnerable to Satan's lies. And at the time when you are wounded, Satan will implant a lie into that situation which can shape the rest of your life until God exposes it and heals you. For example, some very common lies that are common to people who have experienced rejection is, like we said, you have no right to be alive. You must earn love. You must perform for it. You don't deserve it. You're undesirable, ugly, stupid. You deserve to be rejected. It's your fault you were treated that way. You got what you deserve. You can never deserve anyone's love or God's blessing or forgiveness. And Satan loves these lies because as long as you believe his lie, he can control your behavior. You can control anyone if you can convince them to believe a lie. And he loves that. And he just plays on people that way. And then when you have this kind of wound, you can end up rejecting yourself. It's a very serious wound. And you can fear rejection in all relationships. You reject yourself, you just expect people to reject you. And that can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now what happens in adulthood about rejection wounds? Well, there are many, many ways that adults feel rejection. Obviously, a marriage failure would be the commonest, most serious rejection wound because there's a rejection between the, the spouses. And of course, kids will also feel rejection. Unemployment also can be a rejection wound. The death of a spouse can make the surviving spouse feel rejected by the one who departed, even though that sounds so crazy, but that's a very common feeling. And of course, as we discussed this afternoon, marriages that are emotionally codependent, and this is how I define that, two people who marry, assuming that their spouse will meet all of their emotional needs, which includes virtually all of you who are married, when you are codependent on your spouse for your emotional needs, of course, your spouse can never meet your emotional needs. And when your spouse doesn't meet your emotional needs, you will obviously feel rejected by that spouse. And of course, the other spouse will feel rejected by you because you haven't met their needs. So you have two codependent people, neither getting their emotional needs met, both feeling rejected by each other. That's the state of most marriages in my observation. So there's rejection again. And you know what happens when adults experience rejection? What comes up? Their childhood emotions. You see, the adult rejection events remind them and trigger the rejection from their childhood. And then they, the childhood emotions surface and explode out of them. And it can be very embarrassing. Rage, all kinds of very bad childish kind of responses will pour out of people. It's not an adult response. It's a child response because it's the inner child that gets triggered by an adult rejection event. It's the past that comes up. And it can be very disabling and very childlike. And you see, so many of us are very childlike inside. Our emotions are very childlike because we're unhealed. And when our emotional development stops because of our wounding, it doesn't matter how old your body gets, you can still be a wounded child inside because your emotional development stops at that level. And so when that wound is triggered by some event in your adult life, it's the child that reacts. And that's why you see such strong emotions. God wants you to be free of that trap. There's also such a thing as generational rejection. And this is rejection if you belong to a minority that has been, uh, that there's been prejudice against and that has been rejected by another majority group. And you could have a, a wound of rejection that travels through your ethnic line if you are one of a, a minority that was rejected. And this can be generational, any minority. And the whole, your whole ethnic group can be under strongholds of rejection and the expectation of rejection. And when adults are rejected and they feel rejection, there's an incredibly wide variety of responses that we do and we see it in our behavior. So let's go back to the four people we started with. They're all showing symptoms of rejection, though very, very differently. So let's start with the overly sensitive housewife. She needed so much reassurance because she was rejecting herself. She had no confidence, and she was showing what we would call a passive response to rejection. Withdrawal, 
rejecting herself. She was pulling back so she wouldn't interact and risk being rejected again because that hurt the little child who was rejected so long ago. What about the tense, demanding, aggressive, impatient businessman? Well, he was showing chronic anger as his response to his long-standing rejection. And that would be an active response. Anger. He was lashing out. He could not tolerate criticism because it reminded him of his childhood when he was criticized and rejected. So by being angry, it kept everyone intimidated around him so that no one would dare say anything critical to him. And he had become a tremendous Pharisee. He became very religious, very proud, very rigid, very exclusive, the know-it-all Christian, very intolerant, because he didn't want anyone to threaten his little world. What about the wallflower, who never showed initiative? She, too, was rejecting herself. She lived in fear of failure, so she didn't want to be asked to do anything, because if she did something and made a mistake, the rejection would be overwhelming. And she rejected herself, and she was afraid of being rejected. So she passively withdrew. But the wild and crazy, entertaining workaholic, he was showing symptoms of rejection, but he was a performance addict. He craved the constant approval of his friends and co-workers to fill the emptiness inside from his self-rejection. He would do anything to get their attention and to impress them. And this was how he overcompensated for the rejection from his past. And he never thought he belonged in his family, and he always, had to, he always felt he had to earn a place in it. So he feels he has to earn a place in everyone else's heart. And in, in church, in work, he has to feel he has to earn a place. You see, he was rejecting his real self, and he was trying to create a new self that everyone would like, and then convince himself that that was his real self. Well, this is a mess, it doesn't work. And it takes a lot of effort to maintain this kind of a, a false self. And he was so dependent on others, approval, to convince him that he was acceptable, and he became dependent on the reactions of others for his security. Well, this is quicksand to live like that. Because remember, how long does the feeling, the pat on the back, the feeling of approval that people give you, how long does that satisfying feeling last for? Until they lift their hand off your back. Then you crave another pat. And that's performance addiction. So what's going on with all these people and their hurts and how it disrupts their lives? Well, when we have been wounded by rejection, we are left with a scar, an emotional pain, a real historical event when we were hurt. And that's, that's, a, that's a very painful event that stays with us until we're healed. And when Satan sees you emotionally wounded at any age, and when you're in emotional pain, this is his opportunity to plant his lie in your spirit. And what he does is he gives you a wrong conclusion from the, from the wound. So something bad happens to you, and then Satan plants a lie like, did you see what just happened? Based on what just happened, you really are worthless. You see, it did happen. You're worthless. You're undesirable. No one wants you. You deserve to be rejected. You will always be rejected, and you should reject yourself, and you will always be a failure. No one will love you. No one will treat you well. No one will ever meet your needs. You will have to look after yourself. You will always be criticized. You will never be understood. You will never be valued. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. And he plants them in a real historical event, which is your wound. But the conclusion is a lie. But you can't talk someone out of that lie, because if you say, that's not true, and they'll say, oh, yes, it is, because that really did happen to me. Well, it did happen to you. But the conclusion is a lie that Satan has planted in you. And the reason he has done that is so he can control you. So he can control your behavior, because he spends the rest of your life tweaking that lie so that you are always in emotional pain. So no matter what happens, he tries to turn circumstances so that lie is triggered and your pain comes back and you feel that terrible searing pain again and you feel pierced. And unfortunately, you accept the lie as fact 
because it's like it's cemented into place because it was planted in your wound, which is a real event. And that stays with you for life until you are healed. And this pain is so unpleasant, you want to avoid it at all costs. So how do we avoid emotional pain that Satan is continuously poking at? We avoid emotional pain by building walls. We build walls between ourselves to reduce the risk of being hurt again. So this causes tremendous separation between people and the, and, and the, uh, the sense of fear of how you're going to respond because you don't want to risk being hurt again. You don't want to be, risk being rejected again. So we build these very high walls because we're afraid. Well, how does that affect our relationships? Because the high walls, we won't let anyone get close to us because we don't want to be vulnerable because we don't want to be rejected and hurt again. Well, what does that do to marriages? It's terrible because how can you be intimate with someone who has very high walls? And since so many of us are struggling with rejection and avoiding this pain, we have very high walls. And so in many of our marriages, we're in our fortresses, looking over the edge, saying, don't hurt me again. Don't hurt me again. And we have our shields and our arrows saying, if you do that again, and so we're behind our fortresses with our shields, and we call this marriage. <laughs> and we're trying to protect ourselves from being hurt again, from being rejected again. And Satan loves it, because you can't have an intimate relationship with anybody. And of course, how does this affect your ability to parent? You can't parent from behind fortress walls. All you can do is take attendance. <laughs> how does this affect your relationship with God? You won't trust Him either. You're so afraid of being hurt again. You're so afraid of being rejected again. And if you had this problem with your father, you will just assume that God is just as untrustworthy. And you'll, your relationship to God will be behind the same walls. You'll say, I'm a Christian because I said all the right things. But don't ask me to do anything because I don't want to fail. So we hide behind these walls. And what happens is that this destroys our relationships because we can't be vulnerable. And if we can't be vulnerable, you can't have an intimate relationship because that implies vulnerability. And you know, it is even possible to be in the ministry serving everybody, but not letting anyone get close to you. Because you don't want to be vulnerable, because you don't want to be hurt again, but you can give the outward appearance of being a wonderful minister because you meet everyone else's needs, but don't get close to me. And so you can minister even from behind your fortress. Because you can throw down all the right words and you know, look right, but don't get close to me. Because we fear loss of control, because that could trigger our pain and we want to avoid that at all costs. So don't be vulnerable. And unfortunately, most of us choose the pain of loneliness and isolation rather than the risk of further hurt. Well, Satan loves this. Because what does that do to a church? If the church is filled with people all hiding behind their fortresses, including the pastor. So they're all come on Sunday morning, all hiding behind the fortress with their shields up. Let's worship. <laughs> exactly. You've all been there. You know the addresses. It's a common problem. Satan loves this because he can paralyze people, paralyze churches, as long as we're in our fortresses, being slaves to the lie that he planted, that he can tweak anytime he wants, just to remind you that you really are worthless, so don't take a chance. So Satan keeps people in emotional bondage as long as the lie is active. And it will always cause you pain, and you will relive the wound. And so you will do anything to avoid that. And he makes sure that your life events always remind you of the lie and always remind you of the wound so you're always bound. And sometimes he will assign an evil spirit to that lie. And the sole purpose of that evil spirit is to not let you ever shut off that lie. And it just continuously broadcasts that into your mind and into your thoughts so that you cannot stop thinking that and you will always remember it so it keeps hurting you. And that is how you can get a, a demonic component to this. And they're going to become a major stronghold, and you can't get rid of that easily until you're healed. This is a stronghold. And sometimes even more sinister, Satan will assign a spirit of infirmity to that lie, 
and there are some of you who are suffering from physical illnesses as a result of the wound of rejection and the resulting pain in the fortress. And there could be spirits that are attached to the lie and spirits of infirmity, and God wants to set you free from that. You don't have to live that way. But that, I want you to see how the, the wounds of your early life are such an entry point for pain and even demonic harassment. And as long as you stay unhealed from your past wounds, you will stay vulnerable to the lie and vulnerable to the stronghold and vulnerable to attack. And God doesn't want you to live that way any longer. He cares too much for you. He wants you to be free of the lie and the pain. And as I showed you from those examples, there are two common ways that humans respond to pain. Passively, by withdrawing to, to, so there's no risk of being hurt again. Or actively, where you get so angry and so intimidating, you just make sure that everyone is subdued around you so they won't dare threaten your world. Rage, anger, revenge, bitterness, hate, jealousy. You try to dominate and control your world so you're not hurt again. And these are sinful responses. Well, if you respond sinfully to your wounds, what does that do to your bondage? It increases it. Because when you respond sinfully, you give Satan even greater grounds to harass you. Because you're, he's lured you into a trap. And then when you're in this kind of a stronghold, you'll always be tense, expecting to be rejected. And because this becomes an expectation, you will act in such a way to cause people to reject, it, to reject you. So you can say, there, I was right. They were going to reject me. And you acted in such an obnoxious way that they did. <laughs> well, what does this do to your relationships? If you are pre-programmed to force everyone to reject you. It's terrible. It's so isolating. And so many of you are living in isolation because of that very reason. Well, this damages relationships, of course, with others. It damages your relationship with yourself. Because you hate yourself. You reject yourself. And what does it do with your relationship with God? Paralyzing. Absolutely paralyzing. Because you can't trust anyone, including God. And of course, the church is just as paralyzed as the people who attend it. So how come we are so bound up in our fortresses and in our pain and in our lies? Why is it that so many of us are tied down like this? Well, it's because we suffer from emotional bondage. And that is the tool that Satan uses to keep you pinned down and not walking free of the problem I just described to you. See, emotional bondage keeps you nailed down. And you know there are three links in the chain of emotional bondage. And most of you should be able to recite this by now. The three links in the chain of emotional bondage are, number one, there are physical causes of emotional bondage. There are, there are physical illnesses like depression, mood swings, anxiety disorders. And in those conditions, you can't slow down your mind. And so if you can't control your thoughts, you can't control your moods. And this can give you emotional instability. And that we treat medically. That's a physical problem. The second link in the chain of emotional bondage is the direct harassment of darkness. And that's when Satan just inserts thoughts in your mind to torment you. And the third link in the chain of emotional bondage is your woundedness, which is what really we're talking about. It's your wounds that create most of the bondage. And God wants to heal you from all three. And you know what God's solution is to all three links in the chain of emotional bondage? His overwhelming parental love for you. That's the key. That is the one key that explodes all of the links of the chain. His overwhelming love for you. He's your daddy. And it's his love that will break the links of the chain. And we must get in touch with that love to be free. So... What is the process of recovery? What do you think is the result? What will be the result? What could be the result? But you have to choose this. Remember, you don't have to come free. You can be a Christian and never come free of your emotional bondage. You can just stay huddled by the gate in your chains. But what happens to Christians when they come free emotionally? When they come out of their fortresses? When their chains fall off? When they can accept themselves, trust God, accept other people. When they have a confidence level that's, that's present and allows them to move forward. And the power of the lie is broken. What happens to a Christian when that takes place? They're free. And what do Christians look like who are free? They're joyful. They move in a new anointing. 
And how effective are they in evangelism compared to the other group? Well, the difference is striking, isn't it? I mean, the group that's in their chains, I wouldn't say are, 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 are a very attractive evangelistic tool. Because the world looks at them and says, we have enough chains of our own, we don't want new ones. But a believer who is free is an attraction to the world. They'll say, why are you free when we're all broken? And how much anointing can an emotionally healed Christian carry compared to one who's in chains? There's no comparison. And in my opinion, God is calling us now to do evangelism through signs and wonders. Well, if we're going to move in signs and wonders, you have to be free emotionally. There can't be any lies controlling your behavior because that will be a vulnerability for Satan to just hit your lie to slow you down. But we have to be so free emotionally, so free of lies to come out of our fortresses and then we can move in signs and wonders and be emotionally free. Now, would that be an attraction to the world? They will knock down our doors. They will demand extra services so they can come and see emotionally free Christians moving in signs and wonders. So this is a good deal. But to get free, you have to realize that we all have a love deficit that God placed inside us that is so big that only He can fill. There is no human substitute, there is no relationship, there is no person, there is no job. There is no size of bank account that can ever fill your love deficit. It can only come from the love of your Heavenly Father. This is the daddy love that fills your cistern. And when you are filled, then you will have extra to spare to spread to others. And inside of all of us is a child who didn't have enough love, because there's no human who can give us enough love. And we've all been wounded. But the good news is, God has made you unique and special, and He accepts you the way you are. And if God accepted you to bring you into the kingdom and saved you when you were in rebellion and in sin, how much more do you think God accepts you now that you're in His kingdom? So you don't have to worry about rejection by God. He loved you when you were a mess. Now that you're in His kingdom, He still loves you. You don't have to struggle with rejection. And I told the group this afternoon that as a believer, there is only one thing you have to do to win God's or to earn God's approval as a believer. There's only one thing you have to do to earn God's approval. Breathe. That's it. Most of you can handle that. See, if you're breathing, God approves of you. And if you're not breathing, you're in His presence. So you, you can relax about how God feels about you. He loves you overwhelmingly and desperately, and nothing can change that. And you know what else really helps those of us who have suffered with, with rejection? Jesus knows what that feels like. We have a very sympathetic ear in heaven. Jesus knows about rejection. Turn to Isaiah 53. Jesus knows all about this. Isaiah 53, these are very familiar verses, but they're so important to our discussion tonight. Verse 2, he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Jesus even knows what it's like to be physically unappealing. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. He was rejected. Jesus wasn't exempt from emotional pain. He knew what that was like. He came down here to be like us. And he was totally rejected and publicly humiliated. He knows what that's like. And he took that on for us. And remember in our first, uh, the opening passage that we read, that if we trust in him, we will not be put to shame. He took that for us. 
Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted, so we rejected him, of course. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed and set free. And he suffered all of this so that we could come free tonight. The message of the resurrection is not just that we go to heaven after we die. It's that we can be free now. And this is a really incredible deal for us. You don't have to stay in your chains. But to come to freedom, you have to recognize your pain and your wounds. You have to recognize that you do struggle in these areas. You can't get healed of something you're not aware of that's a problem. You have to be aware that you have some of these issues. And you know, it's quite all right to come before the cross with your pain and hurt. It's okay. Jesus invites you to come before the cross with your pain and to hurt there. And remember that... ...what it's like to be rejected. And he wants to lift that right off of you. He just wants to take that rejection onto himself because he is designed to carry your wounds. So you don't have to carry them any longer. Jesus wants to set us free from our emotional bondage and heal our wounds to break the power of the lie because he defeated Satan. He broke the power of lies. He has taken the keys of death from Satan. He has authority over Satan and he can break your lies. And he wants to take all of your contaminated thoughts off of you into himself on the cross so that we can be free. He wants to take all the lies that you've lived with as a result of your wounds to heal the wound, break the power of the lie, and just pour total acceptance and total peace into your heart tonight. He wants you to be free. Now, the first step in coming free, how many of you are tired of living the way you have been? Now, if you want to leave your prison of rejection and lies, the first step in the process of emotional healing is that you have to be a Christian. You have to be in the kingdom. See, everything I said tonight depends on whether it, it assumes that you're in the kingdom. And we want to make an opportunity tonight for those of you who perhaps haven't ever entered the kingdom. And for those of you who have not yet become Christians, if you have never actually given Jesus lordship in your life, I want you to think over your life and the chains that you are living with. And do you want to be free of them? Are you tired of living the way you have been? Because if you're outside of the kingdom, you don't have hope. And the hope that I've described tonight is not available to you until you come into the kingdom where you can have free access to the transforming power of God. And tonight, God is giving you the offer of forgiveness, that he will break your chains, set you free, so you don't have to live with the wounds and the lies. And he wants you to come into his kingdom. He wants to be your daddy. He doesn't want you to live in your loneliness and in your fortress, walled off from other people. So tonight, we want to give you an opportunity if you have never made Jesus Lord of your life. You see, God doesn't want you to continue to flounder in the water, drowning in your pain. We want to throw you a life ring tonight so that you can grab it, come into the kingdom, and be set free. So first, before we go into the prayers of setting Christians free, we want to make opportunity. Are there those of you who have never made Jesus Lord of your life, that you've never asked Jesus to come and forgive you and to give you a new life in Christ, to give you eternal life? Are there any of you who would like to enter the kingdom, or perhaps at one time in the past you had been a Christian, and then through different things, probably your wounds and your hurts, 
or your emotional bondage, you turned away and went back into the world. For those two groups, we want to make an opportunity for you to come and make it right again with God. So I just want to ask, if there are those of you who have never entered the kingdom, or you did it one time and you turned back, I want you to raise your hand if you would like to come free of your pain, of your chains, and make things right with God tonight. And then, of course, you can join us in the prayers of freedom that, are, that we as Christians are entitled to. So are there those who would just raise your hand if you would like to come into the kingdom for the first time or come back if you've drifted away? Are there any of you who would like to come into the kingdom to receive a new inheritance, to leave your chains behind? We just want to give you an opportunity. Thank you for all those who have raised your hands. Now, the way we'd like to, to, to pray with you is that if you would come forward, we have people who would like to meet with you, give you some literature, and we want to pray with you and welcome you into the kingdom. Because there are some things you should pray with us to just formally invite Jesus into your life. And so I would just like to ask now, for those of you who did put your hand up, and if you would like to enter the kingdom now, if you would just come down here, just be into the front here, and come and join our New Life workers, who will then, after we've prayed together, we'll just go into the, the, the side room and give you some literature and pray with you. I just want to invite you right now, because your entire future depends on it. We're throwing you a life ring. You don't have to go down with the ship. We're throwing you a life ring. If you want to end your sinking, end your bondage, come forward. We just, I don't want to stop this too soon. If there are those of you who want to take the life ring, you want to turn your life around tonight, and you haven't entered the kingdom, come now. coming. This life raft has a lot of seats. We've got room for more. Don't let this opportunity slip through your fingers. If you want to enter the kingdom so you can get free of your chains, come now. who wants to come and get on the lifeboat to get out of your, to be free of your past. Jesus knows what it's like to hurt as a human. And he died to set us free of that bondage. And not only just to give us eternal life, but to give you freedom tonight. 
Is there anyone else who wants to get in on this? We just don't want to go on to the, the prayers for all believers until we have given you an opportunity to come. of you who do want to be here, but you're naturally a little timid about coming, and, and that's really understandable. And if you came with someone, if you're standing beside someone who you may have come with or you know, why don't you ask them to come with you? Because it, it can be difficult to walk to the front of this time in uh, auditorium. Ask a, a friend to come with you. We just don't want you to miss an opportunity because you're understandably a little timid. So please come now, even with a, a friend who you may be sitting with, or we just want you to come now. Jesus is offering you a free gift, a freedom. You just have to accept it. He wants to be your dad. Well, now let's pray together. And let's all pray together as we pray the prayer of entering the kingdom. Jesus, I thank you for loving me. Even though I have ignored you and rebelled against you and rejected you, I now ask you to come into my life. I repent of all of my sins. I ask you now to come and wash me clean. I accept your free gift of forgiveness that you provided for me by your death and resurrection. Come and be Lord of my life. Let me hear your voice now instead of the lies of my past. I give you my entire life. Come and be my king and my daddy. Amen. Now, I'd like you to go with the New Life workers to the cafe, I believe. Yes. If you can just go, and then you can meet with them for a few moments, and then come back and join us once again. If you could just go this way right now. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verses 2 to 9, a really familiar portion. John chapter 5, verses 2 to 9. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. Tonight, who is that group of disabled people? Us. Because we have lived our lives in emotional prisons. We have lived our lives in pain, believing lies. We've been pinned down, and we've been paralyzed, and it's like we're the crowd around the pool. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. And many of you have been emotional invalids for a lot longer than 38 years. Because once you were wounded, you became an emotional invalid. And this is us. We're the ones 
lying in paralysis around the pool. When Jesus saw us lying there and learned that he'd been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, and Jesus asks you tonight, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool. When the water is stirred, while I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. So Jesus is asking you, do you want to be well? Well, I'm telling you tonight, the pool of Bethesda is big enough for all of us. And the pool is being stirred tonight for you. And you don't have to miss it. Because Jesus is here tonight to usher you into the pool privately and personally to set you free for your healing. The waters are being stirred tonight. Jesus is here in this room to heal you and to bring you to freedom. But do you want to be well? There is no lack of God's power and presence to touch you tonight. So in a moment, I want you to stand if you want me to pray for you, if you fall into any of the following categories. If you, if you recognize yourself that you have struggled with rejection, if you've seen yourself in some of my illustrations, tonight's your night. I want you to stand. If you know that you've been wounded, if you know that you've been wounded and you've been controlled by a lie, I want you to stand. If you know that there's been strongholds in your life that have controlled you, I want you to stand. If you have some of the chemical imbalances that I've talked about, depression, mood swings, anxiety disorders, attention deficit disorders, if you have any of the physical causes of emotional bondage, I want you to stand too. And if you're just tired of living the way you have been, I want you to stand. <laughs> now come, Holy Spirit. Come upon your people. We just dive into that pool tonight. Father, we just accept your healing power. Now, Father, just release your healing angels upon your people right now. Father, we stand and we admit our needs. We admit our wounds. We admit our lies. We have heard your voice tonight that you have spoken to us and revealed our bonds. Now, Father, just come. Release your healing angels right now. Release your warring angels, Father, to break the chains of, of lies that have so controlled us. Now, Father, first I want to pray for those who suffer with the chemical imbalances, the physical illnesses. Father, in the name of Jesus, just come upon them right now with healing anointing. Let their nerve cells be corrected. Let their chemical balances be restored, Father. Let them come to freedom now. Let their concentration be restored. Let their thought speed return to normal, Father. Set them free. Let their moods come into proper balance. In the name of Jesus, Father, release your healing anointing upon your people for mood disorders. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the authority of the blood of Christ, I break shame off of your people for all those who have these conditions and are so ashamed and have condemned themselves. We break that off your people. Amen. And those who have suffered spirits of rejection and self-rejection, self-hatred because of these illnesses, in the name of Jesus, we break that off you. And we break off you the effects of religious spirits that have attacked you because of your diagnosis. We break that off you right now in the name of Jesus. That religion can no longer hurt you because you happen to have a mood disorder. We just pronounce your freedom from that in the name of Jesus. Now, Father, in the safety of this moment, with you standing right beside us, surrounded by healing and warring angels, Father, I just ask now that in the safety of your presence, you would show us one of the wounds that hurt us, that started a stronghold of rejection in our life. Even though there may be many, Father, just show us one. In the safety of this moment, Father, with you standing right there, and you standing right there in the historical event way back, show us one of these memories that wounded us, one of these events 
so that we can see how it happened, how it hurt us. Now, Father, pour your healing love and your healing anointing into that situation, that memory that you're showing us right now. Show us your love in that situation. Let us feel your arms around us, Father. Let us just feel the grip of your arms saying, I love you. I love you. They may be hurting you, but I love you. Come, Holy Spirit. Reveal to us your compassion, your total acceptance for us, even at that time of wounding. Come, Holy Spirit. Just heal us of that memory. Heal us of the pain of that event that wounded us, that started strongholds of rejection. Now, Father, show us the lie that Satan planted into that event that has so disrupted our lives for so long. What was the lie that was planted in our hearts at that moment where we were rejected? Lies like you're worthless, you deserve to be rejected, you brought this on yourself, you should reject yourself, and you will always be rejected. Lies like that, Father. Show us the lie that came out of that wound. Now, Father, speak to us in your kind and gentle way the truth that will break the power of that lie. Come, Holy Spirit, tell us your response to that lie, that we are accepted, that we are loved, that we are beautiful in your sight. You did plan our life. You look forward to our birth. We were not a mistake. You celebrated our birth. We were the right sex. You planned it. Before we were formed in the womb, you knew us. Father, allow us to hear your healing words that you are speaking to us right now to replace the lies, to replace the wounded, angry child's thoughts that we've lived with for so long. Come, Holy Spirit. Show us that we are your workmanship. We've been created in Jesus to do good things. Father, come and reverse the effect of the lie. Let us hear your truth, how much you love us. Now, Father, we forgive all those who wounded us. We forgive the people responsible for the wound that you just showed us. We forgive them. We forgive our parents. We forgive our spouses. We forgive our ex spouses for how they hurt us. We forgive our teachers. We forgive our pastors. We forgive our employers. We forgive everyone in positions of authority over us, Father, who started rejection in us. We give them a gift that they don't deserve, that they may not even want, and they may not even be alive. But, Father, we want to be free, so we forgive them. You forgave us, Father, and we sure didn't deserve that. So we now forgive them so that we can be free of our chains. And, Father, we know that we were at fault, too, and we repent for hating them for what they did to us. We repent for hating them. We judge them. And even though they hurt us, we sinned in our response. And we repent for our role in that. We repent, Father, that we believed Satan's lie. We didn't know any better. We repent for believing his lie when we were wounded. We repent for hating ourselves and rejecting ourselves because we believed the lie. We repent for hating ourselves. And we repent for the way we have treated others because of our pain that we have hurt other people, Father, in our attitudes, in our pain, and we cause them to reject us. We repent for our role in this. Even though we weren't aware of it, we repent. Now come, Holy Spirit. Pour your healing anointing into these wounds and all these areas that we have repented and forgiven. Pour your healing anointing so these chains will come off. Now, Father, we just take all of our painful memories all of the lies and wounds, all of that garbage from the past. And Father, we now just hand it to you on the cross. We just voluntarily give all of this pain to you 
because you were wounded to set us free. Now come, Holy Spirit. Come and take our diseased thoughts into yourself. Put them on the cross where they belong. And now set us free. Father, replace those diseased thoughts with thoughts of peace and joy and acceptance forever. Reveal your daddy love to us, Father, as you take off all of our corrupted thoughts. Free us from the rejection. Now put us on your lap where we can remain forever. Because, Father, we're all just five years old in your lap, really. And, Lord, just hold us there in your lap so that we would feel your warm embrace. Come and be our daddy. Now, in the name of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and in the authority of the blood of Christ, I break the power of lies off of your people right now, Father. The power of lies. The chains that have held your people, Father, we break the power of lies off of your people. In the name of Jesus, I command every evil spirit attached to those lies to be broken right now and lift off your people. Every force of darkness that has claimed rights to you because of the wound and the lie, we break that off of you now in the name of Jesus. The fire of God, come and set your people free. We break spirits of rejection off your people, Father. All the forces of darkness that stoked the lie that you couldn't shut it off, we break that off your people now in the name of Jesus. Spirits of self-hatred, we break that off of your people now, Father. That we no longer have to hate ourselves and reject ourselves, we break that off. Now, Father, for all those who are suffering from physical illnesses as a result of their rejection, Father, in the name of Jesus, we break the spirits of infirmity off your people now. In the name of Jesus, now come, fire of God, set your captives free. Bring health and healing as we come out of rejection, Father. Come, Holy Spirit. Complete your work of freedom. Now, Father, we choose to walk to freedom. We choose to come out of our prisons. We choose to leave the gate of the kingdom and come into your throne room. We choose to repent and forgive. We choose now to start a new life with you. We choose to walk away from our old habits of relating to people. We choose freedom. We choose life. We choose truth. And Father, take down the walls that we have lived behind for so long. The fortresses, the fortresses that we have built to protect ourselves from pain, that have isolated us from relationships, that have ruined our capacity for intimacy. Father, in the name of Jesus, break the walls down, that we can be vulnerable again in the safety of your presence. Now come, Holy Spirit, restore our capacity for intimacy as the walls come down. Now, fire of God, come and set your people free. Set your people free, Father, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen.
before we move into a general ministry time, just want to ask you to, to listen to the Father. We've been speaking out to Him. Just want you to sit down in your seat and take five minutes of quiet and ask Him what He has to say. He may take you back to a scene, a moment of wounding. He may take you to a feeling. Or he may just take you right into his presence. Let's give him an opportunity to speak. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. And we know there's incredible things that you have to say to us. And it's all so personal and so individual. We just want to say right now, we trust you with what you want to say to us. So I welcome you to go, to take us wherever you want us to go. We don't have a set agenda to what, where you want to take us right now. Holy Spirit, take us to that place. Let us feel those feelings we felt then. And we confess those things to you. And then we take the next step of asking you, where were you then? And what were you saying? What are you saying to me right now, Lord? Thank you, Lord. You're speaking. We want to hear your voice.
just continue to ask the Lord, not only what were you saying, but what are you doing? Where are you? Where were you then? Some of you are having a hard time believing he was really there. And for those of you, I just want to encourage you to ask his forgiveness for just assuming he didn't care and for not believing that he wanted to be there. Ask his forgiveness and then see what happens. Some of you are having a hard time with hearing his voice. You're seeing him. You're watching what he's doing. And you're blown away by it, but you're having a hard time hearing his voice. If that's the case, I just want to encourage you to maybe go back and ask forgiveness. Um, you know, forgive your father, your earthly father, for not speaking those words that you needed to hear. Just go out and speak quietly of forgiveness because he couldn't always say the right things and sometimes he said too much or too little. And if you had a bad response, then ask forgiveness for that. And then go back and say, Lord, what are you saying? You can be surprised. Father, I thank you for coming. Thank you for speaking. Your words are more precious than anybody else's. And your touch brings us alive. So we invite you. Come, come again. We believe your words.
know he's not in a hurry. He's been waiting to talk to you, for some of you, for a very long time. He's been waiting to hold you. He's been waiting to show you where he was when you were so hurt. Father, what you say is more valuable than any man's words, and so we come to you again. And for some of us, you've just done so many good things already, just in these few moments. We want to let you into another place. Would you just take us to another place? Oh. We give you the freedom. Go back through our memory box. Turn the page of the album to those places that we don't want to go back to. But God, we can trust you wherever you want to go. We just submit our whole picture album of our life to you. You take us back any place you want to go, and we'll go there. And we'll tell you how it felt to be there. We can trust you enough to tell you how it felt to, to open ourselves up to you vulnerably. And God, if there's any forgiveness we need to do, and if there's anything we have to ask forgiveness for, we're open to do that. And then, then would you show us in this new picture, in this new page, in this new moment, where were you? What were you saying? What were you doing? If any of you are dying for some Kleenex, just put your hand up. There's loving people.